Welcome to worship this Sunday from the confines of wherever you are. Get a cup of coffee, make yourself comfortable, not too comfortable, because we want to be ready to worship our Lord today. A couple of things that I want to make you aware of. Um, the next Women's Book Club is on Tuesday, March the 2nd. The book is the same kind of different as me. It's a great book. It's based on a true story. Uh, there's a movie that's been made, uh, made uh, about the book. And uh, that's going to be the next discussion, March the 2nd. Now, the men's breakfast was postponed from yesterday to this coming Saturday. And we've got the books in. We've got a few books, and they're also able to download it. We're going to be looking at a time for confidence. What a fitting thing to discuss in the climate that we're in now. So those are the things that, that we need to know. But I want to do something else. I've never done this uh, as we have a welcome, but I think it'd be it's very, very important. You know, in our country, we think things might be seem, seeming to be unraveling a bit. Uh, the things that are going on, we shake our heads. But what we have in our country is nothing like what's going on right now in Pastor David's country, in Miramar. You might be reading about it on the news. Uh, you know, we support uh, Pastor David, we support his church, and we support his ministry, and we're linked to it. And we want to make sure that we're keeping abreast of what's going on and that we want to pray. Now, uh, Firefall International, uh, uh, Jim and Nancy Pennington, sent this email out. And I want to read, you, read because we're going to pray right now for the situation going on there. Let me, let me just, this is from Pastor David. Let me read to you some of their updates. Curfew has been instituted, and the military is arresting many people at night. They're sneaking around at night arresting people. Just a couple of nights ago, some of David's friends were arrested, and they were sent to prison. Imagine this. Banks are closed. Nobody has access to funds. Nobody has access to any foreign funds from outside the country or savings inside the country. Imagine if that was us. Well, naturally... The wealthy have gone and bought all the food. And so just by supply and demand, all the prices of food have risen. Even the internet will be shut down because of all the things that are going on there. He's in trouble. The country's in trouble. God will deliver him. God's purpose will be established. But what I want to do now is as his partner, I want us to pray. So follow me as I pray for Pastor David and the country there. Lord, we pray for the people over there who are in fear and who are struggling to meet their daily needs. There's innocent people who are being arrested. We want to pray for them and for their families. We want to pray that if it's in your plan for there to be a change, that it won't be done with bloodshed. And especially, Lord, we pray for the house of glory for David and for the church planners who are trying to look after their flocks. And we pray that in the midst of fear and darkness, the light of Jesus will shine upon that country. Father, we know that you're in charge, just like you're in charge here. And we pray that you'd hear these prayers for your honor and for your glory. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying. Now let's turn our hearts to the Lord and let's worship him. Call to worship. The Lord calls us together to worship wherever we are, whether we're in the sanctuary or whether we're worshiping in our footy pajamas. It's great that we can worship the Lord in the sanctuary 
called his creation. Our call to worship is, comes from Psalm 145. It's a Psalm of David. Listen to the words as we prepare our hearts. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the technology to where we can worship you, even though we desire to be together in one place. Yet we know that you're present in the power of your Holy Spirit. So we ask this morning that our worship would not only be pleasing in your sight, but it would be pleasing in our sight because we delight in you. Bless our worship, O Lord. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Please join with us as we sing, To God Be the Glory. Follow along on the video for our <clears throat> prayer of confession. How wonderful it is that we can confess our sins. First uh, John 1 on says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. We recognize that he has already cleansed us of our unrighteousness. Follow along as we recite our prayer of confession together. Heavenly Father, we bow before you confessing that we have too often forgotten we are yours. It's seen by our actions and inactions. Grant us, Lord, a heart of repentance, an appreciation for your mercy, clear minds and open hearts, and the strength to live in a way 
that pleases you. Now, Lord, hear our prayers of confession. Father, thank you that we can come into your presence, even as lawbreakers. We can come into your presence by faith because you have made us right because of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we do pray that you would call to our mind, not in a sense of morbid introspection or guilt or woe is me, but make us aware of the things that we're doing and not doing so that we can repent, <clears throat> so that we can continue to experience the cleansing power of the blood of your Son. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. And now let's join together as we think about all of God's blessings by singing the doxology. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you bless us. We thank you for the riches that are found in your grace. Lord, and as we give, we pray that we might use these gifts of worship wisely, with good judgment and with wisdom and with purpose, so that we might further your kingdom under your strength and power. And it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Please join us as we now sing Amazing Grace. Oh, 
Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come before you to rejoice in you and in the promises we find in your word. Although we are at various locations this morning, we are united in our worship and we praise you for your mercy and goodness, acknowledging you as our sovereign Lord. You have clearly told us what pleases you and how we are to conduct ourselves. Through your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, you showed by his example so that we may more clearly understand your words. We so often fall short of obeying your commands, for that we are truly sorry and ask for your forgiveness. Teach us to be more compassionate and loving with one another. You have given us your Holy Spirit to teach and to guide us, yet we are so often not sensitive to his leading in our lives. Help us to hear and follow when he speaks to us, and convicts us to live a better life in obedience to your word. What you ask of us is really so simple. We are to love each other as Jesus has loved us. You know our hearts, Lord. Cast out any envy and selfishness. Fill our hearts with compassion and love for one another in the body of Christ. May that love be seen and spread to others that they too may come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We are grateful for the many mercies that you show each of us. Continue to bless our congregation, strengthening us in faith and in number, that we may give you the glory. Be with those in our congregation who are traveling this week. Protect them and return them safely to us. For our members who are ill and recovering from health problems, we ask that you make your healing touch felt in their lives. For those mourning the loss of their loved ones, we ask that you bring them your comfort and peace. Lay on the hearts of our leaders, both locally and nationally, the desire to lead us according to your word. Guard and protect our troops who may be serving in harm's way. May they feel your holy presence beside them, bringing them comfort. We also lift up to you the first responders serving in Hot Springs Village and the surrounding area. Bless them with safety as they serve to protect and aid us in our needs. This Sunday is the second anniversary of Reverend Karsten's being our pastor. Our congregation has been blessed by his and Marilyn's presence among us. May he continue to serve you for many years here at Woodlands Presbyterian Church. We ask that you bless Reverend Karsten's and his family and that your Holy Spirit fills and empowers him as he prepares to teach from your word this morning. Through hearing your word, we come to more dearly love your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. He showed us that we may always come before you in prayer, and that you are faithful to hear us. It was he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is Galatians 3, verses 19 through 25. 
Hear now the reading of God's word. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a few had been for if a law had been given that could impact life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that ever whatever was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, and we are no longer under the supervision of the law. So ends the reading of God's word. Thank you, Helen. Well, welcome back to our study in Galatians. We're over halfway through the book. We're in the, towards the end of chapter 3. Uh, and I hope that you can remember a little bit what we've talked about, uh, about Paul having to deal with these false teachers. Now, we spent about a month and a half talking about how these Judaizers were going around telling these new believers in Galatia that Paul had been instrumental in, in leading to the Lord. And they were saying that believing in Jesus Christ was not enough. Now, sometimes people live their lives thinking, well, I know I have Jesus, but I'm still wanna, I still want to add to that by being a good person because that way I think God might like me a little more. Well, that's in a sense of what was going on then. Um, they were saying that having Jesus is not enough. You had to obey the law in order to be justified, which we have been spending time talking about that. So, what exactly is the law that they're talking about? Well, they're talking about, of course, all the Jewish laws and all the ceremonial laws and the 613 uh, different laws and, 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 and interpretations of the laws, societal laws, the Ten Commandments. You had to keep all of those because salvation is Jesus Christ plus good works. We tend to live that way. And the argument that Paul was making, his defense, his apology was very simple. We are made right with God, not by what we do, but by what Jesus Christ has already done. Because you see, if we were made right with God by what we do, if we're good enough, I hope I'm good enough, if we're good enough, well, then we wouldn't need a Savior, would we? We'd be our own Savior. Jesus is the one that saves. That's where we are. So we want to get that. It's an old message, but boy, it's new every morning. New every morning. We want to understand that. So people have asked the question, and it's a natural question. It's a good question. So, so then why do we have law? Why do we even have it? If Paul is saying, you look, that's no basis of our salvation, and that's a decent question. I mean, the law, if you think about it, is a pretty big deal. The law of God. I mean, just ask Charlton Heston and Cecil B. DeMille. You know, they were there when God gave the law in the movie. You know, Ten Commandments. Glorious. There's a lot of action. There's fire, there's wind, there's thunder, there's lightning, all for the, you know, it showed the glory of God, and it was awesome, and it was impressive, and it was, it was pretty scary. If you read about it in Scripture. And I would think from that and from other places in Scripture, since it's so prevalent, then God must be pro-law. He must be in favor of the law. I mean, why did God give the law? Why did he give the Ten Commandments, the ceremonies, the sacrificial system? And the short answer is yes, because he is in favor of law. Why did he do it? 
Well, do you remember when Moses came down from that mountain and then when he rounded the curve on the path, he looked down and he saw the nation of Israel. They had, they had made a golden calf and they were engaging in riotous revelry as they're worshiping this, this idol. They were being just like all the other nations. And they were the ones that God had chosen. They're the ones that he had set them set apart to be his chosen people. They were distinct. And God gave them the law so that by obeying the law, people would see that they're different. They would see that they're distinct. They would see that, that, that they're the ones through whom the message of salvation would come. That people would relate to God by seeing how they were. How he w- That's why he wanted them to live in obedience. They're distinct and they're set apart, so he gave them the law. Now, another thing that the law does, that's what we're going to focus on today, is that the law shows we're sinful. Because while the law is good, we can't keep all of the laws. And so then the law, especially the sacrificial system, shows or points to our need for a Savior. For Jesus Christ, because we fail the law and we're left hopeless. But the, 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 the law that Paul is speaking about here, and we need to understand this because this is how it relates to us today, the law that he's talking about is more than what the Judaizers were proposing because you can go way back in Scripture and just with common sense, if you think about yourself, God created man in his image with what is called a sense of, of God, a sense of the divine. Man, everyone has a law within them. Call it our conscience. Let me show you what I mean. Remember uh, Adam and Eve? Remember what God told them? The first promise God made mankind was in the form of a law. He said, Here's how you'll be blessed. It says you can enjoy everything there is. You can be fruitful. You can multiply. You can rule. You can reign as my vice regents. You can walk in fellowship with me. It's all for you to enjoy. But one thing you cannot do under the penalty of death is eat of this tree. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was law. That was a divine promise. It was really a bilateral agreement that we talked about last week. God said you will be blessed if you do this. It's called the covenant of works. See, God is pro-law. We know what happened. Just like if you see a sign in the window that says, do not throw rocks. Well, they, they threw some rocks at the window. And what happened? Well, afterwards... Adam and Eve are hiding. They're naked. They realize it. They're they're ashamed. Their conscience, their innate divine law written within them, condemned them. Adam even blamed Eve. And God says, where are you? Read Romans 1 and 2. You get the same idea. The point is this. There is a law written in the hearts of man by which we'll be judged. Romans 3 says, for we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Seems like a dismal picture, but it's not, because it doesn't end there. There's a God sense in everyone. There's a sense of what's right and wrong in there. Now, people twist it. People ignore it. People uh, uh, rationalize it. They twist it and use it for their their own ends. But what the law tells us is that we're lawbreakers. Adam and Eve knew it. They were shut up to sin and so were we. The beauty of it is is it shows us that we need God's grace and mercy. And God was there in the garden still and he is here. He searched them out immediately after they broke those commandments and he did something special. They were ashamed. And yet we see God's gracious hand at work. He sought them and he found them. So in his mercy, they were exposed in their nakedness. But in his mercy, he killed an animal 
and he clothed them in the skins of the animal. He covered their shame. Then if you just read a little further, we find that, that he didn't stop there. He instituted a new covenant, a new promise. He said, there will be one who comes, a seed of a woman who will be your deliverer. The covenant of grace, the unilateral promise that God gave, that will be fulfilled in the seed of a woman, that's Jesus Christ. What's the point of saying all this? Max Locato puts it like this, the cost of your sin is more than you can pay, and the gift of God is more than you can imagine. See, the law points the person with ears to hear and eyes to see, points them to their need of a Savior, a need of God's grace and mercy. And that's any law. That can be societal laws. That can be scriptural commands. That could be the laws of our conscience, even though it's corrupted by sin. The point is, we fall short. Now, let me show you how the law, how the law works. Several years ago, I was t- returning from a, a great Fellowship of Christian Athletes camp where, where I was the featured speaker. Can you believe that? I was the evening speaker, and, and, and I was driving, and it was a few miles from home, and, and I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, I'm listening to Christian music. I'm thanking the Lord that He gave me such a good message that I'm certain was a blessing for everyone, and I was lost in the moment when I crested a hill and began picking up speed. And as I was picking up speed, out of the corner of my eye, I didn't pay any attention, but a car passed me. That's a normal thing. And I didn't really notice that down the road after it passed me, the car turned around. And then it was gaining rapidly on me. But I did notice in my rearview mirror that it had red and blue lights above it, and they were on. So naturally, I thought, well, someone must be in trouble. So I wanted to pull over and and, and let them pass and get out of the way. Well, when I pulled over, They pulled over too, and I was the one that was in trouble. I I couldn't believe it. Now, here's the thing. Don't you think that the speed limit is a good thing? I mean, imagine, imagine if we didn't have a law governing the speed and people could drive however they wanted to drive. Imagine what would happen. It's a good law, and it's designed like good laws are to protect and to regulate. But I wasn't thinking, wow, I'm stopped because of I was speeding and this is such a wonderful law. Instead, I wasn't thinking in those terms right at all. My my peaceful mood changed all of a sudden and I was because I was caught or being accused of breaking the law. My first inclination was, well, I couldn't be me. I wasn't speeding. And the hair on the back of my neck was slowly beginning to stand up, just, just like when Jerry sees a neighborhood cat. And in my mind, I was becoming defensive, claiming not guilty. I mean, think about it. I, I just came from doing God's work. What a noble thing. I, I don't deserve this ticket. What about all the criminals on the loose? I mean, here I am, a preacher. I mean, here I am, a, a really good guy, and I'm getting a ticket. When you should be catching the people who are really doing bad stuff, the really bad people. Well, as I reflected on that incident, and I'm sure there are other incidents that we won't talk about, I noticed some things. I noticed some telltale signs of the law working on my sinful nature. See if you've ever done this. First thing I noticed is that I was looking for credit for my good deeds, hoping they would outweigh the bad. I was defending myself. I was doing God's work. What a wonderful thing. I should be released from the debt of this ticket because I am so special. Looking for credit. Or or here's one. I found I was comparing myself with other people. I mean, think about it. Here I am just minding my own business, not hurting anyone. And I'll bet you there are people that that speed all the time. I'll bet you there are people that not only that, they're careless. They're, they're, They're sending text messages while they're driving or reading something on their phone and not paying attention. And I'm way better than them. 
Comparing yourselves with others. Another one, I was guarding my reputation. Hey, I'm a preacher. I'm doing something that's really important. And then another thing I noticed, I was holding others to a higher standard than I was even meeting myself. I'll bet you this policeman's not perfect. And I'm going to hold him to it if I get the chance. But you know what? I knew that speeding was wrong. I knew that this policeman, this trooper, wasn't making a mistake. You know how I knew? It's because when the lights were flashing behind me, I did what everybody does. You have a natural inclination to slow down. And when I started slowing down after a few seconds and I looked at the speedometer, I had actually slowed down to the speed limit which proves that I must have been above the speed limit when they caught me. She, uh, the, the, the policeman was right. Actually, it was a woman. And I was wrong. And I broke the law. And I should pay the penalty. And here's the point. At all levels, at some level, we're all lawbreakers. And this little speeding episode is just an example. The fact is, we keep God's commands, which are for our protection, uh, or fail to keep them, which are for our protection and for our provision. They're found, the commands found in His Word. What about the debts that we rack up every day? What about that evil thought, maybe just in passing, or that judgmental thought, or coveting, or anger, or lying, or losing control, or holding people to a legalistic standard, or whatever it might be, et cetera, et cetera. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. The amount we owe in our heavenly bank account is getting pretty long over the years. Too long. Breaking a law. Now, whether it's a public statute or, or, or whether it's a law in the Bible or a law in our conscience shows our lack. And eventually, like Adam and Eve, we're without excuse. Romans 3.20 For no man can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what his law commands. For the more we know God's law, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying it. So what's the law like? What's this law? Well, the law is like a mirror. You know, we wake up and we look in in the mirror in the morning to see what's there and to see what should be there or whatever, where stuff is. Or in the afternoon after yard work and you look and you got dirt all over you and things need to change. Dirty face, dirty hands. or, Or morning saliva or messy hair. Whatever it might be, you don't take the mirror and wipe the stuff off your face and you don't take a mirror and use the mirror to clean your hands. All the mirror does is show you what is there. We need something else, don't we? We need something other than the mirror in order to clean ourselves up. The law is like a mirror. The law points us to the need to be cleansed, but it doesn't cleanse us. Martin Luther said, the law is a minister preparing the way for God's grace. Think about that. You see, the law of God, his commands, his precepts that are found in his word and that are worked out in society. I'm talking about just laws, reasonable laws, even those we don't don't keep. But, But to a repentant sinner, the law takes a new meaning. We have a new view of it. It shows us how amazing God's grace really is. Because if we take the law seriously, we see it as God's best for us, as his design for us. And we see that we can't do it without his help. The law of God shows us how our faith should express ourselves, how we should live in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. The greatest commandments. And yet the law doesn't give the power to do it. Thanks be to God that by His love and by His grace and by His mercy, He sent a Savior. 
to do what we could not do. Obey the law. We stand condemned. Thanks be to God that Jesus Christ took that condemnation upon himself. It was meant for us. And now we're justified by faith, made right with God by our faith, solely in what Jesus Christ has done. That's what we've been talking about for a month and a half. But here's the thing. Living by faith, and that's what we're going to turn our attention to in the remainder as we study this book, living by faith requires that we pay attention to the commands and the law and the precepts in the Word. Because the very same law that does not justify us points us how to live and how to please the one who did justify us. We believe in faith and we walk by faith. And we even rejoice that the ceremonial law has been fulfilled. It is pointed to Jesus Christ and it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why we don't need to keep sacrificing because Jesus has done that. You know, and as we walk by faith, our law is found in the Word of God. And look at how those who live by faith treat the Word of God. Listen to this. Psalm 119. Blessed are those who walk in the way of the Lord. Blessed are those who delight in His statutes. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from Thy law. It's the Bible. Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. These are the commands and promises found in the Word of God. See, the law of God, His moral law founded, grounded in His commands for obedience, which is designed to protect us, designed to provide for us, designed to lead us to His amazing grace. And when we fall short, we repent. We go back to it. We keep trusting. We ask for His help. We go to Him fully aware, once again, that there, by the grace of God, go I. We are forgiven. So may God grant us a love for the law and the freedom that's found in His promise. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for Your law and how it shows us our need for You. Father, when You ever show us our need, You grant us Your supply. Father, may we walk with repentant hearts and have delight in Your Word so that we we may walk in a manner with Your help in a way that pleases You and pleases us as well. And it's in Your Son's name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn today is the great hymn by Charles Wesley entitled, And Can It Be?
Well, I hope this made sense. I think we might need to talk a little bit more about the beauty of God's law as it relates uh, to the world that we live in. But for now, let's receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you, may he guide you, and may he keep you in perfect peace because of his Son, our Savior, in whose name we pray, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Stay warm. Thank you.